I think I will be awake for the next hour for sure. My talk won't last for an hour. Uh, I think uh, it is an uh, opportunity to be all together and uh, to discuss uh, the topic uh, where well, there is no, I think, uh, definite answer. So uh, feel free to, to prepare all your questions. I may not have all answers, but I will do my best. So in, in a keynote, I could do, oops, doesn't work, okay. Uh, I, small technical issue, but yes, it's working. So here is the agenda. First of all, I would like to give a perspective of the subject, which is uh, growing, but also, and it's not at all a critic of what we are doing or what you are doing. Um, we still have a uh, linear knowledge, and I will explain uh, why. Uh, in the logistics side of uh, e-commerce and urban logistics. So I will develop what we all know, uh, what are the impacts, and uh, I noticed in the previous uh, presentation that uh, there are ongoing uh, research on that, and uh, what we don't know, which is also quite important because it, it, it implies that we need to do more research. Uh, question raised, um, I think uh, we could really question what we are doing and where we are heading to. And uh, then I will go to our proposal, uh, what kind of uh, developments we, we, we are doing. It's research, it's also linked to engineering. As Claire mentioned, I have a engineering background, so um, it's also about design. So uh, let's start with uh, what we, we see. Uh, here is a small example, a captation from uh, what's going on in China. China is by far the, the biggest uh, country and where uh, e-commerce is, uh, uh, we see the largest activities. And um, maybe you know, but uh, Alibaba is planning uh, uh, a parcel network for 1 billion parcel a day. Uh, and is not the single operator uh, in, in China. There is also SF Express, JD, and so on. So it is something really huge, but not only huge, it's also, um, a bit, I would say, crazy because uh, we generate huge peaks of demand. And we have to deal with the peaks when we have to design the capacity to deal with the peaks. And peaks are totally artificial. Here, it's something that doesn't really ring a bell for European people, which is the double 11. For us, double 11 is not really a, a day for shopping, but uh, in China, it is the single day. It is something that was invented. It's pure marketing. And it's completely crazy the number of parcels they are able to ship and they should receive within the next day or the next days. And a significant proportion of the parcels are returned. Because, you know, in the Cra that crazy day, <laughs> you buy, 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 there is some kind of fever. And then in the next day, you wake up and say, ooh, <laughs> what I did. And then you ship back. So you may really question um, what we are doing. And I used to say that uh, as logistician, uh, we have been asked to do crazy things. And, and guess what? We are proud to do it. <laughs> but that's a, a big question. The, uh, so, um, us, we have somehow uh, with um, some kind of schizophrenic behavior because on one side we buy online and we are happy with that and we could save time and, and things like that. While on the other side, we co always complain about the trucks in the streets and some kind of uh, sorting uh, in the middle of the street to deliver the, the last meters uh, with some... Um, a delivery man, and it looks like uh, for me, uh, with again a engineering background, this is not 21st century operations for me. It looks like uh, it's completely improvised. It is not, of course, uh, there are real professionals behind, but for me, it looks like it's a transition phase. It's not the ultimate development of what we may see in the future, and in that sense, it's not sustainable as well. Uh, so that's what we have, that's what we see. And usually I'm quite surprised that there is no 
real investigation of uh, the impact. And one way to uh, measure the impact, and here uh, we have, I think, much more competent economists in the room than I am because I'm more uh, manage with a management um, uh, expertise. Uh, here there is a, a report, it is um, originated from TU Delft about the external costs of transportation and freight logistics um, external costs. And when you do the math um, for Paris, this is Paris, you may have recognized, but this is Paris. When you do the math for Paris, it's something that is about 1 billion per year. So it's, if you compare to the GDP, you say it's okay. <laughs> but if you take it as this number, you say 1 billion per year, maybe we can do something to mitigate the impact. And as it is, it's hard to find solutions. And maybe if the problem is 1 billion, the size of the problem is 1 billion, is not just with few bicycles that the problem is gonna be solved. Maybe the problem is more, is bigger than that and requires uh, more, uh, let's say, industrial solutions. So, and what is also quite astonishing is, it's not a quiz, but um, you may guess how many people are in charge uh, from the Mairie de Paris, in charge of logistics in Paris to deal with the problem. Sorry? Quatre personnes? Dix? No, it's uh, uh, actually two. Okay, so when I met there, I said, oh, I'm very uh, honored to meet you. You say, are you, are you kidding us? So <laughs> I'm honored because you are in charge of one billion. So I think there is a, a lack of knowledge uh, about the impacts. Of course, it, it, the impacts are air congestion, air pollution, CO2 emissions, noise, accidents, and so on, okay? Uh, so it's quite a big problem, not that big, and it's a problem that is totally inevitable. By that, I mean that, and we saw that during the COVID-19, uh, the pandemic, the crisis, you can stop a lot of things, logistics accepted. Uh, you cannot stop logistics. So, and especially in cities, you cannot stop logistics. You can always complain, but there is no city without logistics, uh, period. So we have to deal with that problem. So what are the trends? Are we heading the right way? If I look uh, at, um, and if I make the hypothesis that we consume the same amount, let's say the food, it's quite an important delivery in cities. We consume the same amount more or less, every day or around the year, uh, with almost within Paris, the same population, we should have more or less the same volumes. But what we did, we invented different distribution channels and one of the major ones now is e-commerce. But the multiplication of channels is also a multiplication of distribution channels. And maybe sometimes with different packaging, different stock keeping units, so we, uh, as a first response, we had different supply chains, which means that everything equals, we have less quantity per channel. So we have some kind of fragmentation of flows among the channel. And of course, it's gonna be harder to manage all the flows. And there is a risk of uh, stock out, there is a risk also of overstock and uh, scrap and so on. Uh, the second point is, and uh, it was well uh, presented before, so I think it's the, the fragmentation in, in time. It started long ago with a just-in-time policy which we came from the industry. Um, so instead of delivering one thing as a big batch, we have multiple deliveries. Of course, it's not that hard to understand that the there will be a consequence for the supply chain, there will be a consequence on the transportation means, there will be a consequence on the infrastructure and so on. And what we see 
um, is now we have we came from 20 hour 20 four hours delivery and then three hours delivery and then now in paris we have up to 10 minutes um deliveries so when you think about uh, yeah, <laughs> you should think about that uh and by the way if you're not in the city you need to go fast to reach the consumer and in e-commerce there is some kind of uh, uh, a game that is played and mostly by marketing which is the e-commerce are not really present in the city. And, but not the, for the customer not to be aware of that, you should propose to deliver fast because most of the products you're gonna find online, you're gonna find them also, if you live in Paris, they are nearby. They are just around you. Paris can be seen also as a huge warehouse, a set of warehouses. But to not think so much about that, the e-commerce should promise and deliver fast. Okay, fast because coming from outside. Most of the time, except for the 10 minutes, of course, you need to be in the city and we'll see if it's a real market or not uh, to be to deliver the chips or the, the bottle of water in 10 minutes because you never thought that you're gonna have a, an aperitif just before dinner and then you totally forgot. Uh, one of the main consequences, which is this one, is that um, the median weight, and it's not just for cities, but I think it's a under known um, number. Uh, and this study, I would like to have an update, but I haven't know the update. It is, um, we started with 160 kilogram in 1988, and uh, the median weight uh, was in 2004, 30 kilograms, which means that the medium weight was divided by 4.5 in 16 years. And of course, in 2004, the e-commerce weight in the economy was close to zero, which means from my point of view, and I, I think it's a shame that we don't have an update on the, that survey, it's that here, if the, there is, we still have the same trend, it means that we are going to maybe four or five kilograms and in the future we are uh, heading towards maybe one kilogram as a medium weight. And it is something that of course has strong consequences on the supply chain design. You can imagine the amount of sorting and everything. So for a postal operator it could be a, a very nice opportunity because more it means more parcels. Uh, for the same global amount, but it's also more energy, more packaging and, and everything, of course. Here, yeah, it's a bit technical, but it's almost the same, uh, uh, the same thing. We have here two curves. The so it's a cumulative weight here, and here it's the number of shipments. So what you see here, basically here you have the letters. A huge number of shipments, <laughs> but a total weight that is close to zero, okay? And here you have, uh, let's say the, the pipeline with the oil, you have a single delivery or almost a serial delivery, but with a, a lot of tons uh, in a single delivery, okay? And of course, in between, you have all the different uh, logistic activities. What is really important here is that if we go to e-commerce, it means that the, 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 the curve will uh, somehow like a cliff, like uh, gonna slide, okay? Which means that we're gonna have here much more activity for the same total amount. And which means that we're gonna have much more deliveries. And then also uh, impacts that are going with the deliveries. Okay, so I'm not sure we are uh, heading in the right direction. Uh, from a sustainability point of view, from a congestion point of view, and, and that kind of uh, that kind of, of problem. So, if I want a confirmation, here is the um, the trips done by heavy duty vehicles. Here, sorry, it's the French heavy duty vehicles. More or less, it's flat. And here you have light duty vehicles, vans, and so on. And you see that in the last, uh, let's say, uh, thirty years there is a net increase of 70%, almost 70% of the traffic. So we are shifting from heavy consolidated shipments 
to small shipments and, and as a direct consequence we are going to smaller vehicles okay and of course you may wonder which one has the bigger impact on the environment but and also on the society so i did the math for you uh, knowing that uh, here if i take a, a truck yeah, I put it in green. Usually the truck, it's in black and it's, uh, it's, it's awful, but um, you can have a payload that is up to 25 tons. Of course, it, if, if it is filled just with parcels, you will never reach 25 tons because uh, you will saturate with the volume first and you never reach the, um, the ton limit. And here uh, you have the gram of CO2 per uh, ton kilometers, so divided by the weight. Of course, when you are able to completely fill the truck, uh, you have that kind of uh, emissions per ton. And if you are not able to fill it, there is an increase of emissions per quantity delivered. And of course, at some point, it is a better idea to, it's a good idea to switch to a smaller vehicle and again, it is a better idea to switch to a smaller vehicle. And at some point here, uh, we have a proposal made by a famous uh, um, um, uh, web merchant that is, uh, you could go to drone. Uh, do you, from a sustainability point of view, is it a good idea? Uh, it is not that I'm not sure. I'm sure it is not a good idea. Uh, there is a very good paper uh, that I reviewed in, um, Nature communication that is said that the footprint of a drone is at least the equivalent of a van, not to mention the footprint, the real footprint with all the drone ports that you need everywhere. Uh, so, frankly, it is more advertising than uh, anything else. And uh, if we remember when it was uh, announced, it was just before the Black Friday, and I think that everything uh, was said at that time. <laughs> Um, but it was quite um, strange for me to see that we saw so many uh, operators surfing on that wave, knowing that uh, nobody, I think, in the room was delivered once, at least once by a drone uh, in uh, maybe uh, eight years from now, because it was announced something like uh, 2013 or, or something like that. And what is also quite incredible is that here, the total amount of emissions for a full truckload uh, for a, a, an empty truckload, the total emission is about 70% of the full truckload, which means that the marginal emissions of a shipment that you're going to put on a truck is really interesting from an environmental point of view. And for a van or a car, it's even uh, more interesting. So the problem that we have now is that the, what was released by the European Commission, and it is for transportation, so it is also for freight transportation, it is what we achieved so far, and I can tell you that uh, a lot of things were done in the last uh, decades. And this is the next target that we have in CO2. Okay, and that's the ultimate one. And of course, you have to remember that in the meantime, the traffic just sold for the light duty vehicles, which means that there is no real need to target minus, uh, minus 60, you can only target zero. So if you miss it a little bit, it's going to be okay. But if you target minus 60%, you're going to miss the target by far. So here we have a real challenge. And it's not just about switching to electricity. Uh, I just mentioned uh, before, I, I was astonished to read in a newspaper that there is a new electric car that you can buy, a uh, nice Swedish, uh, not top end, but uh, medium range uh, car. And electric cars say, oh, it's going to be uh, environmental friendly. The weight is 2.2 tons. OK? <laughs> so you think about, I'm coming from Ecole des Mines. So if you think about all the raw materials that you need to process in order to make the, the car, 2.2 tons, you're, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure we are going in the right way. So that's what we have. And I want to mention also that when we're talking about freight transportation and logistics, CO2 is just the, what we see above the surface because you know that there are all the pollutants. And even with electric cars, you still have the, the brakes that are going to emit some uh, uh, particles that are very, uh, not very human friendly. 
Uh, we have also congestions. We all face that noise is going to be reduced by the electricity, uh, accidents, lens utilization, and so on. And of course, what I just saw in the previous, uh, we, we shared with you in the previous slides is well to will, and we have to think about the perimeter of the emissions, not only in the city, you say, oh, it's cool, we have electric cars, so the air is cleaner, but we need to produce the energy. And right now we know that the energy is also quite a, a challenge and it's never without consequences. So here we have also another consequence which is if we are moving to smaller vehicles, here is the forecast. Uh, it's not made by me, uh, it's uh, OECD, uh, about the impact on infrastructure. And the impact is coming mostly from freight because as individuals, we won't spend more time in our cars or on a daily basis. So it's mainly coming from freight. And here you have the picture in 2010, you see that Europe is already quite congested, especially in, uh, in Germany and the Netherlands. But if we go to 2030, not so far from now, and 2050, uh, if everything goes um, along the trend that was forecasted, this is what we have. It, you see that kind of snowball effect uh, on the infrastructure and so on. Um, so we are really addicted to logistics. And when you have a 1% increase of growth, usually you have more than 1% of growth in logistic activities. So we are really dependent. And in the last two years, we were also quite dependent. And you know that all the lockdowns effects and so on, we diminished uh, the CO2 emission by something by 7%. Something we, that we need to do every year not 7% every year, but 10% on top of seven, on top of seven and so on. So it's, uh, it's, it's really something that is a challenge. So a couple of subjects that I want to raise and share with you. The first one is about the density. I, sh I saw, I, I share with you, sorry, I, I share with you, I, I saw that also, it's, 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 it came to my office. So I am uh, <laughs> responsible for this one. <laughs> no, I didn't, uh, was not there for the packaging, but uh, I order it, so <laughs> I'm responsible. Uh, for me, density is something that is never in the official statistics. It's something that we should ask for. We should have the density of shipments. Uh, because I think that uh, more and more, we are shipping air and we don't have to ship air. By shipping air, I mean, <laughs> we have a lot of void, uh, not only in the trailers, but also in the parcels. And the increase of density is something that uh, for me is quite important. So it's, it's not in the statistics, so nobody is aware of it, Really, uh, maybe in the room we are aware of that, but uh, we are not enough to change uh, everything, but we should be more uh, cautious about that subject. Uh, if I think that my record is not uh, like the density of helium, but a little bit below that, but uh, close to the density of air. I received a, a package with just a very small, uh, tiny plastic uh, part uh, inside. Uh, here, I think that um, there is also a responsibility for uh, coming from the different companies to charge also not only uh, based on the weight, but also on the weight volume ratio. Uh, and when uh, there is a huge volume, should be uh, um, should be um, ship uh, should be sorry uh, charge on the volume uh, aspect, okay? So um, I know that a couple of companies are already playing that game to, to charge also the volume. And I think it's something that is really needed to change uh, what we are doing and to at least increase the density of our uh, shipment. Something else, um, I was invited in the Mairie de Paris to talk about urban logistics and all the morning, we talked about urban logistics. And at the end of the morning, I was like, you know, we talk about something we don't know. 
because in Paris and uh, the people in charge themselves, they don't know where it's coming from, from which part of the city the freight enters, and what is really the traffic, and what is what are the 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 routes. Of course, the, each company they know what they do, but the global vision, there is a lack of global vision. When you, the, in France there is a laboratory that is a specialist uh, in the transportation economics, and they when they do a, a survey, it's like a picture. They they took a picture. It take it's something like one million for a picture, one million euro for a picture, and eighteen months to develop the picture. You know, like the old style. <laughs> so when the picture is available, the picture is obsolete. So. I'm not just there to say that we have problems. We try also to find solutions. And with uh, a company that was in the past uh, sister company of <laughs> Laplace, uh, Orange, we uh, are tracking SIM cards all over the network. It seems a good idea and easy to implement. It's a, it's a total nightmare from a math point of view because the only thing you know is the position of the antenna. And sometimes you have a SIM card that is switching between two antennas. And the question is, is the SIM card moving or it is just the network that is balancing the load <laughs> between the two antenna. But now here you see, we are able to uh, find the, the freight uh, traces, do, do the tracking uh, of uh, almost uh, real time. And of course, all of that is done fully compliant of RGPD and all regulations uh, that a telecom uh, operator is subject to, because you can imagine that uh, it's quite touchy, <laughs> touchy data, not to mention uh, military applications that you can imagine behind that and, and so on. But now we have that vision, but not in Paris, because in Paris, so, and up to now, it's too complicated. We are not that accurate. Our picture is too fuzzy. So we could have printed what's going on in Paris, but it's just a, just a blue patch and that's it. So if you're interested to collaborate and go further with, uh, do some kind of machine learning with us and uh, so we can go and proceed and illuminates what's going on in Paris, uh, inside Paris, which is, I think, the next, uh, next challenge. But by the way, this is a sneak view. It was never published. So, uh, but it's going to appear, I think, in a pretty good journal uh, when it's going to be finished. And we have all the, the freight uh, all over France uh, and maps and so on. And we'll be able to understand what's going on. So another thing. Um, it's something that was discussed also in a, in a previous presentation. Like uh, in logistics, we have some kind of strange behavior. Usually, when someone is doing something late and is in the rush, it's not something that is a, a nice behavior. So it's like uh, you're late, you're not smart. But in logistics, we, we like to go fast and uh, do things in the last minute. And we like the demand is completely unpredictable. But when you study what is sold with the with merchants uh, in two hours or one hour, you're a bit astonished about the things. Uh, and I'm working with different companies in my share, like Procter and Gamble. This is the the ugly part of my uh, presentation. But uh, they they sell toilet paper. Even ten minutes is going to be long and embarrassing. And you can predict that you're going to need it. You, can, you don't have to wait until the last minute. Okay, it's not smart at all. And here uh, you have all the guys with the bicycles and so on. It seems like I take it is not at all. Of course, you have apps and so on to organize the, the demand and the supply of the service. But from a logistician point of view, just one guy doing one thing. It is, I'm coming from the industry. <laughs> From an industry point of view, it's, it looks like uh, it's not a very good development, right? It's just the beginning. So, um, and again, uh, it is really high tech. I don't think so. It is desirable. It is really sustainable. It is really the way that we want a part of our uh, population to live. Like there is one in the coach 
that's going to go fat and one that is <laughs> bicycling all day long uh, with 40 degrees uh, or minus 10 degrees. Is that what we want? Well, I'm not sure. So again, uh, and I'm coming back. I'm, I'm coming back to the industry side. Uh, I think that we lose what we should seek, which is the scale effect. Transportation scale effect is really important. We know that uh, a train is way more efficient than a truck, which is way more efficient than a, a van, which is way more efficient than a car. So maybe in the future, we may have more logistics and it's going to be more sustainable if we avoid all the trips with the cars. Because here on this uh, little figure, we have the same amount of goods <laughs> carried by different transportation means. Of course, when we go to the city center, there is no way we can enter with the ray car or the wagon in Paris in, in front of each door to do the delivery because it doesn't make any sense but it means that we have to postpone until the last meter at the last minute the switch to a lighter transportation means guess what is what's happening now the trend was to put the logistic as far as we can from the city center in the ancient time maybe 40 50, 50 years ago the big market, Leal in Paris, was not a shopping mall, but was the place where all the shops were gathered to distribute in Paris. Now, of course, it is 15 kilometers away, and the suppliers are even further away. So if you start with that kind of vehicles, you lose already, uh, if you start 15 kilometers away. That, that's, we lose the scale effect. Another thing is, um, at, at the beginning, we had just one operator with some kind of monopoly. Monopoly is not a good idea. So now we have plenty of operators and uh, it, it's a nightmare to, and we know all that. We can order online four times and be delivered by four different operators and each of them, they will follow uh, each other in the street. And we have to coordinate all that. And by uh, no way we were able to find a solution so everything is is gathered and during the weekend i'm going to go from one relay point to another to collect all the all the shipments so synergies we are still looking for synergies and what is quite interesting is when you discuss with uh, a company leader he says most of yes we are looking for scale effect and we are big the bigger we are the most effective we are but it stops at the boundary of the company. Uh, and the, you can take as many companies as you want. Scales effect, uh, scope effects, good, but just for us. Uh, maybe at some point, the flows are so fragmented that we should consider that we need to do something else. There is another uh, challenge uh, here, which is about the competencies that we need. On one side, it is really the industry. And uh, I know pretty well some La Poste uh, sorting centers. It is industry. This is heavy industry. And at the end, this is service. What we have is service. So we should decouple the two things in a nice way. And we should decouple it in the right position, not too early in the supply chain, not, and not too late also, because otherwise it means there, there will be some kind of robots. <laughs> and there is still, I think, uh, a lot of um, here um, uh, services to be promoted and, and done for elderly people, disabled, and so on. Uh, because the last meter is not always uh, the best one. I, we saw also in that field, um, and we still see a lot of innovations, uh, but not yet the solution. So if I put everything together, uh, this is what we have, um, different schemes. So here I imagine that there is a train that is able to do long distance and, and, and go to warehouse or distribution center nearby the city. So you have a, a footprint in CO2 that is quite small. Then here you have a full truck load going to the supermarket and then you take your car to go shopping, which is not such a good idea. Uh, and here you could have, of course, you could challenge the, the numbers and have different views, but more or less 
uh, it gives you the main schemes that we have. Of course, I could have here a bicycle uh, for the last mile or here uh, a bicycle to, to challenge the, uh, the last mile. And you see that we have different options, but it will be mainly impacted by the organization, not the technology, but the organization. How do we organize ourselves? Where do we shop? Uh, what kind of vehicles we're we going to use and that kind of things. And another uh, interesting uh, consequence is that the emissions are more or less independent of the distance. When I take my car and I buy uh, tennis balls uh, in the suburbs and I come back, I'm just going to double the emissions from, from the, for the tennis ball from coming from Asia to the shop because I move more than a ton or maybe 2.2 tons if I have an electric vehicle just to come back with a few grams. In that regard, it's way better to order online and been delivered, okay? Um, so if I look at the means that we use now, and I'm gonna go to the, the, some kind of solutions here, uh, we did some kind of a computation based on the um, survey made on a uh, thousand uh, trucks. And we've been able to compute what we call the overall efficiency. If you're familiar with the industry, we used to assess the performance of an equipment with the overall efficiency, which means that we start with an idea that's gonna work perfectly over 24 hours. And then we compare the actual performance to the, on the same time period. And I can do the pie chart or the camembert in French. Uh, and look at the losses idle nobody so maybe with automations this is gonna disappear handling look how, how much time we spend in waiting time waiting like at gates uh, to be dock for the docking and so on uh it's incredible uh the, some kind of rest of course empty trips capacity loss congestion and efficient trip of course we will never divide the number of trucks by 10 if i do the same math for personal vehicle it's even worse <laughs> it's maybe two to three percent of uh, overall efficiency and uh, but here it means that there are there is room for improvement for sure so we may have maybe we have too many trucks and we are too wealthy to think about uh, how to better use the resources of course you may think that we're going to put everything electric and it's going to be okay this is not my point my point is we're going to go to interconnection which brings us to the postal world. In our work, we think that we should better use resources and share resources like car sharing. So working together, and um, I was really interested to discover in the postal history that we are not even noticed that because we are used to that, but in the postal world, everything is interconnected. You put a postcard, we used to do that. <laughs> In a, in a mailbox and it pops up on the other way of the planet Earth. Try to do that with the pallet, it, it will never work, okay? It will never work. And if you think about a world that is not organized like that, you think that you should, if you look for a, com a country, you have as many <laughs> letterbox that, that you have as operators. It's completely crazy and you should buy the right stamp, by the way, other way. <laughs> otherwise it won't work. Okay, so he, for us, for letter, it seems perfectly normal to have just a single box or at home for the internet, it seems perfectly normal to have a single uh, internet box. But when it comes to logistics, we have tons of operators, tons of standards, and it seems also perfectly normal, which is for me a little bit crazy. So here, what do we, it doesn't mean that there is no competition or it's a monopoly, it's another question. Here I'm talking about interconnection of services. So source of, also source of inspiration of flip cart or lunch boxes in India, uh, one system to bring all the food cooked by the woman to the men at work every day. Really efficient, just one small container, the same for everyone, a coding system to tell where it should go. Here, the maritime container, which is, I think, the most efficient tool that we have in logistics. This is why it's so affordable to receive goods from China. Uh, 
and fully standardized. And here in uh, in uh, in Japan, another operator with standardized containers um, at Chinese level. So at uh, Japanese level, sorry. So here, what we are looking at is what does it mean to have a physical internet? The digital internet, we know where it is. It's the interconnection of all computers' networks. And we don't care about the provider and so on. It goes. In logistics, it's not at all the same thing. So what does it mean to have a physical internet, which means where all logistics services could be interconnected with each other, not only to ship, but also to store, uh, to do the, uh, to stock, sorry, not to store, to stock. Um, and we, we did, so for that, we need obviously some kind of uh, uh, asset sharing, um, flow consolidation at physical level digital level process and legal approaches. And what we have here is some kind of paradox. We have the traffic on the road and we have a full line of trucks, one behind each other. And we always wonder why we need in France, the French minister to take in charge the fact that we should have a train between Perpignan and Rangis, which seems uh, uh, a little bit uh, uh, crazy again. And here are the flows. The flows are the different orders from the different companies and so on. Here, uh, I'm representing the, the flows from the first top 100 suppliers of Carrefour and Casino going to the different warehouses. So you have all the major players. And they are operated independently. This is why it is so hard to, <laughs> to have everything in a train because everything is run independently and the coordination of this is a total nightmare the pooling and so on, that nobody wants that. So here we have a network that does exactly the same services, but it's, it's concentrated, it's more hierarchical with the backbone and the, the end uh, loop and so on. And of course it could be operated by different companies and we are experimenting, what does it mean? What is the power of that concept? And we, we, we published a little um, couple of papers, uh, science included so i was a pretty uh, <laughs> coming from logistics uh, to publish in the top journal was like <laughs> and um so here we compare the two schemes um each each uh year captation is like a thesis uh of work behind and here you have uh, the number of days of traditional f fast moving consumer goods um uh shipment not uh fresh products and you spend days then you run with a truck you spend days you run with a truck spend days you run and then you end up on the on the shelves and here if you have that kind of network that is interconnected you may uh, go at different speeds especially if you take a train which is faster than a truck by the way um, when it's uh, operating and you go from one hub to another that could be shared so it means that you don't have to put everything in the same place, because even if you're Procter & Gamble or whatever, you have just one warehouse in France. And if you have a problem or lockdown, whatever, of floating in that area, you're stuck. You don't have 50 because you cannot own 50 warehouses. But if it's open and shared, why don't put your eggs, all your eggs in the same basket? And we did the math about robustness of such networks. It's a way better. And there is no more inventory. At the first, we thought maybe there will be much more inventory. But here, there is no more inventory. Why? Because the network is the safety. It's not anymore the stockpile of product that you put in the middle of nowhere. The safety is the network. So we had very good numbers, and uh, we were uh, pleased with that. And then we said, OK, what do we need? What we need is to improve handling. So logistics is not a fancy subject, but handling, handling it's, uh, it's, it's nobody is interested in handling. But handling is key to saturate the transportation means. And here is an example of what the maritime container did to the maritime shipping industry. Here is the cost of a shipment of medicines of pills uh, from Chicago to Nancy in the 60s. Here it's the, the value that would be today if nothing changed inflation okay and here is the actual cost and what do you see you see that the the 
the reward transport didn't really change. No real improvement, no real innovation. If you look here, uh, the, the, the maritime transport, the cost was really divided, but what was what is really impressive here is the port transit and angling. The revolution of the container is not the ship, it's the crane. And if you have an efficient crane, sorry, or <laughs> I dream of an efficient train for freight, but if you have an efficient crane, then you can go from one transportation mean to another without jeopardizing the cost, the, the, the lead time, and so on. So this is an obscure subject, but a key subject. And if I look at my sidewalk in Paris, I'd say, hey, I'm not living in 21st century. I'm living in the 19th, 18th century. So we need to find mechanism to help coordination and so on. And uh, with that, I know you have a pretty of, a lot of subjects uh, behind that that you know. So we try to um, create a game like the beer game to, to advocate, to advertise the fact that we need to work on that. We need to work on transshipment. We need to have not only market space for spots or for a single drive, but also to consolidate freight. So it's the, in addition to an efficient handling, it's a way, I will not disclose all the detail and it's, it's late and it's gonna be lunch soon, um, but uh, we are working on mechanism. So you don't have to disclose your capacity. You don't have to give private information, but you're familiar with that. And we are still able to consolidate flows in an efficient manner. So we have to deal with the physical side and the coordination side. We are also working with different uh, companies and operators, not just an idea. Uh, we are working with JS1 to have uh, all the codes. When you think about it, the address, all the operators, they maintain databases about address of customers and consignees. And most of them are not accurate. So there is a, we all duplicate the effort for uh, what, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure. So we are working on something that could be like IP address. So we have a single address and behind that we have all the features that we need to be delivered. And of course, if I own the address, I will be really interested to maintain it accurately. Uh, we are working also with startups. I have to mention that Urbi and Logissimo are two uh, spin-off of Lapos that are also doing some kind of consolidation, which I think is a really good idea. Uh, it's a stuff, but uh, <laughs> it's a good idea, should be done, should be tested until it works. Um, and I encourage you to go to the ALICE website, which is the uh, Alliance for Logistic Innovation for Collaboration in, in Europe. And ALICE is a European technology platform uh, recognized by the European Commission. And the goal is to make happen the physical internet by 2030. So we have 10 years, no, eight years from now to test, try and improve. Uh, the concept and do the work again until uh, we find something that works. Um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm late. <laughs> uh, let's speed up. So three, um, three things to finish. Um, smart city. So I have a PhD student working on that. Does it bring value to know all the states of the different assets in the city? like parking spaces and so on. So we are working on that. Uh, could we do better if we have a better view? Uh, that's what we try. Of course, from a technological point of view, it's a nightmare. We need to connect different objects. We need the, the object to discover themselves, to talk to each other, to be authorized to talk to each other and to do the coordination mechanism. It's a nightmare, but if you want to park and find the parking place where you need it, that's what you need to have. Um, another thing, and I will finish this. Uh, I have it's, uh, two slides and I, I'm, I'm done. Um, I'm always wondering why we have such a poor design. In Paris, Paris is a beautiful city. Most of the people, we travel on the ground, okay? While the freight enjoys the view. Yeah, it seems natural, we are used to that. 
But when you think about it, say, what happened? <laughs> of course, there are reasons for that. <laughs> but we are stuck in that design. And I think it's a, it's a shame. <laughs> and I think it's something that should be changed in the future. If we want to avoid congestion, if you want to avoid to spend energy like crazy, we should avoid to go and stop and go and stop. The only way to do that is to go where there is still space available, which is deep underground. <laughs> and the Swiss, and not only the Swiss, the Chinese as well, uh, there are a lot of projects like that on the way. Right now, we'll see if it's worth it, uh, if there is a business model. Of course, this system is going to be shared. By no way, uh, an operator will be able to pay for its own system, like a port. It will be shared, of course. OK, so let's see. Another thing that I'm questioning is the, the time of the delivery in the day. We have peaks. Of course, if you want to have an infrastructure, even a urban consolidation center, if you use it two or three hours a day, it's not, it's not efficient. And uh, the return on investment is not really easy to achieve. So the big question behind is, do we need to deliver not everything, but most of the thing in the morning? Not sure. I just learned a, a survey with students. So they go to all shops and, and they ask them when they are delivered, <laughs> if it's an issue for them, and if they are ready to change. So we are collecting the answers. And we will share with you the answers when we will ask them. And with that, I thank you very much. So thank you a lot, uh, Eric, for this uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, no, it's perfect. <laughs> so if uh... I'm sorry for when I'm jet lag, my English is uh, I lose my English with the uh, with the jet lag. <laughs> No question. All was perfectly clear. <laughs> was it clear? No. <laughs> no, but this this one is no. No, I forgot this one. But just one final remark. You know that in France we have a, we go when we go to ski, we all go to ski on the same day, which is just in France. To mean that there is no there is this, it's not something that's universal or that's a, like a law of nature or whatever. <laughs> we decided we're going to go all on Saturday <laughs> and come back on Saturday, which is a huge nightmare for the infrastructure and so on. Yes, you have a question. Yeah, it's very, it's very interesting to hear what you're saying. We need more coordination. We need more to work together to smooth things out. But how do we practically do that? in a competitive environment where, as you said, companies think of their boundaries as what they need to do. So in a competitive capitalistic society, how, how can we realistically move to that more efficient environment? What, what can we practically do where we are all individuals, but it pays to coordinate? So it's yes. a coordination versus individual. Thing. So yes, um, yes, it's, um, it's a very good question. <laughs> Um, the, we are working on mechanism to find incentives for company to share. Like if you have a warehouse and you know that you have empty space, it can be a decision to say, okay, but it is I said at some point that this warehouse is quite costly. <laughs> And I'm ready to open it to others. It's happening. Uh, at least a dozen of startups are working on that. The like the booking.com, but for uh, the let's go warehousing <laughs> open and shared. Because when you have the capacity, you're also interested in a capitalist <laughs> world to make investment. So it's starting, it's slow. Because I think there are a lot of barriers, uh, not only in the mindset, but also uh, in the IT systems. 
all the legacy system were not designed. They are designed in silos and they were not designed to be connected to each other. But what we see with the, the SaaS, you know, the software as a service and things like that, Internet of Things that is coming, I think that a couple of barriers with some kind of universal language, business languages like uh, uh, GS1 for FMCG, uh, there will be less barriers uh, in the future. And what we see today, uh, I never gave, I, <laughs> when I'm speaking and the oil of price is low, Nobody pays interest <laughs> to what I'm saying, <laughs> okay? When nowadays with dro um, driver shortages, <laughs> oil price and so on, you pay attention to that subject, okay? And you are ready to open your mind. And I have another uh, point to make here. Companies, they put the data in Amazon's uh, web services. That is something... Uh, quite uh, with some value and quite strategic. And you're not ready to, so they share the data, the data repository, the data warehouse, and you're not ready to share the warehouse. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, we are still working on that. And transportation is more a much more complex problem when you want to solve it from an operational point of view, coordinates all the flows. We are working on that, but it's the uh, NPR, the, <laughs> problems and so on that are just behind. So we are, we are trying to find, doing some benchmarks and so on, but uh, it is still hard, but I think it's the, the complexity that we need, to, we need to tackle to, to go to the next level. Yeah, economics, coordination, consolidation, an economics of coordination and consolidation problem. Yeah. And I think you need to get the economics and the, the, the cost of the consolidation down because until that happens, you won't get people freely willing yes. to do it. There's got to be a, a, an incentive here. Yes, we are working on handling boxes in Germany with um, maybe 20 companies, big retailers and big suppliers to cut the handling cost. Well, there is another project, which is uh, I'm not able to talk about, about a container for the city. Again, to cost, to cut the handling cost. And then there is also, but all the, the startups that I, I uh, mentioned to you have been very fast. Uh, they are doing double digit savings by the coordination of flows. The then it pays. And then if you ask the customers why you are doing, you are using them for, for the money, <laughs> for the economics. But we need more investment in that uh, to, to make it work, so for sure. But you know, it's 1 billion to improve by 1% the yield of a diesel engine. We should put the same amount of money Sorry. Uh, a bit of a provocation. Is a monopoly in logistics be uh, a good solution for the planet? <laughs> <laughs> well, you mean uh, run by or? <laughs> uh, it, is, it is out of my uh, scope of competency. I'm not an economist, so I'm not able to speak about monopoly and competition. Uh, I think that it's good to have an open system uh, because I'm pretty sure that at the end, uh, if it's like, uh, if there is just Google, we are too dependent of uh, an operator. That's not such a good idea. Um, but um, my goal is really to have different systems to work together. I think it's the most resilient way and if there is just one and the one is on strike, imagine the power of the union uh, in that system. So, so it should be distributed from my point of view, both technically and legally and uh, to be robust. Yeah, thank you. We, we are all nostalgic of the good old times of monopoly. Um, no, more seriously, um, it's my question just in the middle. I mean, um, can we really trust the forces of the market 
or should there be some regulation, some some uh, um, decisions made by municipalities or whoever to 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 maybe just start the dynamics of the market or or to 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 you're, arrange you're, things? You are absolutely right. I think that we saw uh, in the last two years the power of the states, of the governments, and how uh, they are able to shape or reshape uh, the market and the practices. Uh, for me, it will not happen just by, uh, I'm, again, I'm out of my confidence zone here, so, <laughs> uh, but uh, policy, regulations, um, for sure, it's not just techni a, a technical issue, and it's also an issue for every one of us. If we are aware, we, heard, we talked about, uh, is it a green delivery or an orange delivery or red delivery, what do we do? Are we going to pick the green ones? It's going to be two days later or not? So I think it's uh, a subject, but I'm open to any collaboration in the field that I'm not uh, good in. <laughs> what we're doing, we're putting the, the subject on the table and uh, try to crunch it, try to uh, do better, try, but we're proposing something else. So, no, no other question. So, uh, I uh, thank you a lot, Eric, for uh, this discussion. Thank you very much.